guys. So today the Pepper Preppers are going to make off-grid, grid-down, no-power biscuits so that if you do not have a way to uh, access an oven, you can still make the comfort foods that your family really craves. So Catherine should be coming in here pretty quick. So what we're going to start off with first is this is the book that we're going to be cooking from. It's Dining on a Dime, and it's about being frugal, but part of being frugal is being able to cook from scratch. If you're not having to buy a lot of boxed goods, then you're saving yourself a lot of money, and so everything from here is from scratch. And hey, Catherine, let's see if we can figure out how to add you. Yeah, I, uh, we had originally planned for me to do it out on the barbecue, but it's kind of windy and the lighting was very bad. But we currently have fallen in love with cooking with cast iron on our stovetop. So today I am going to be making biscuits on the stovetop in cast iron. And how will you be making biscuits and gravy today, Julie? Um, we have the rocket stove that has a little oven on it and so this is going to be a very traditional build in that if you were 200 years ago and you were a mom making bread, you would make, you would actually heat up your, your, your wood burning stove and you would be really, really hot in your house for a very short amount of time, but you do all your baking for the week. And so this felt really authentic to do it both ways. Right. So I love the versatility of the cast iron, and we'll talk about that later because you can cook however you so choose on them. So, so as Julie said today, we're going to be making biscuits and gravy out of Dining on a Dime cookbook. We're going to get our links up for these because this is an affiliate for us. So if you guys are interested, if you fall in love with the cookbooks that uh, we're using today, because these recipes are all super easy, and most all of them, and this is what Julie and I like about them, is that most all the recipes uh, call for ingredients that we are already storing in our food storage. So, yeah. All right. The other thing about um, that I did want to point out for everybody who's like, well, I'll just use my normal pans when we're cooking off grid. The problem with that is if you did have to resort to using uh, charcoal, if you did have to resort to using an open flame, whatever you use has to not have plastic handles and it can't be thin. Um, something like this you could do, um, but it will be hard on your pan. The enamel is not going to recover very well, so having plain old cast iron is something you can use in open flame. You can use coals, and, um, and you're not going to be destroying it, and you're not going to be melting your pot. Then the first thing that we were going to look at is that when you have your basics, a lot of times you can run out of your dry goods, and knowing how to remake some of your dry goods is really important. Like, for instance, if you have baking powder, um, say, for instance, you're, you're doing something that requires baking powder. Baking powder is actually made from other ingredients. And so today, doing baking powder biscuits, we're actually going to start off with a recipe that um, teaches you how to make your own baking powder. Um, it's just two ingredients. It's uh, cream of tartar and baking soda. So I keep things like baking soda. I like to keep a year's worth of this kind of thing because even though they clump up, you can break them down and they turn into other things. So things like baking soda and flours. And the other thing we wanted to talk about was what kind of oil, what kind of fat you're going to be using in your cooking. Butter needs to keep refrigerated in order to stay well or frozen. So I recommend something like lard or... Um, some other kind of, of solid, uh, something like shortening. Uh, I don't like to use a lot of vegetable shortening. So this is bacon grease from our own bacon, or mm -hmm. from our own pig that we butchered. You want Not necessarily shelf stable. I know my grandparents used to keep it on the countertop. I, I tend to keep it refrigerated, but in a grid down situation, I would definitely use my own pig fat and lard and bacon grease. So are we going to go ahead and start mixing up our ingredients in bulk? We buy the big 50-pound bags. And what we do in order to store it in our pantry for easier access is we fill up Tupperwares that we keep on the shelf. How do you make your long-term bulk food storage easily accessible to you and your family? 
I, I like to keep my flowers in something pretty on the counter. I feel like I have more of a tendency to bake if I have a small amount. So I'll, I'll have the majority of my food storage in the plastic buckets, like under a bench or something. But then I'll have a small amount that's really easily accessible. Mice can't get into this. Um, it's, it's glass. And you can get them at secondhand stores. I think I bought mine on Amazon as a set of two because it was I, I was having a hard time finding them at secondhand stores. Um, okay. But I find if it's pretty, I bake with it more. So we buy uh, salt in 25 pound bags and I keep them in mason jars. Oh, we get humid over the summer, so I add rice. I don't know if you guys can see that, but there's little pieces of rice in there. So I run mine through a quick strainer before I dump it in because more than once I've put rice into my food and my kids kind of complain. <laughs> it sounds crunchy. <laughs> it does sound crunchy. So um, Tara's recipe here for the make it home baking powder happens to be the exact amount that we need to put into the baking powder biscuits. So it's a make it for this one recipe and you've got enough on hand to do what you need to do. So. Am I slack in here? I haven't even added my butter yet. Um, when I like to bake in my tiny house, I try to keep as few utensils around. The more bowls I have, the more water I have to haul. And so yeah. right now I have two pots. One is my grandma's stew pot that I still have. And the other one is my pressure cooking, is my pressure cooking pot. And what I have in this is some soapy water so that I can just put things in to have them be washed. And so this is my washing receptacle and it works a lot better. Because again, when you're hauling your water because you're off grid, the less you have to wash, you, you want to use that water for drinking. You don't want to be using it for washing everything. Well, even being on grid, I know that I've shared this before, but we've got a very low producing well. And so water conservation is something that is always a concern here. So we operate, even though we are on grid, we operate very similar as far as our water usage and being conscientious of how we use it and how much we use. Um, I like to use butter. I don't like to use a lot of vegetable oil. If I'm going to use a vegetable oil, um, I will use avocado oil. But if you're making something like a biscuit, it's the cold uh, butter. It's the, it's the state that the butter is in or the state that the lard is in or the state that the Crisco is in that actually forms your biscuit so that it does what it's supposed to do. And so generally, I'll cook with something like avocado oil. Um, but... If you're making something like this, you do need something that's going to be solid state. You don't want to melt your butter. You want it to be somewhat, you want it soft, but slightly, slightly stiff still. Right. So Angie said she sees us fine and hello. Uh, John, uh, thank you. He said to remind us to tell everybody to please like and share this video. So the more you like and share it, the more it gets it out in front of other people. Facebook is such a weird monster. And if you guys aren't liking and sharing it, it assumes that you don't like it. And so it puts it in front of less people. So thank you for the hearts and the likes. So that helps us as far as getting out and sharing what it is that we're doing with other people because we wanna, we wanna empower other people to not feel scared, to not feel like they don't have the skills in order to do this. We want you to be able to feel like you can bake at home, that you can do these things, whether you have electricity or no electricity whether it's a normal average every day or whether it's a emergency situation in which you are having to feed your family and there aren't a lot of options. So thank you for helping us share. Yes. So this recipe calls for milk. I'm using goat milk that I milked from my goat this morning. In a grid down true emergency situation, you can purchase things like freeze dried and powdered milk. There is freeze-dried and powdered butter. So, uh, you're not limited to, let's say, you're in the city and you have aspirations of being on a homestead, but you're not there yet. There are options for you. Uh, if you don't have to necessarily go outside and milk your goat, you can also have long-term food storage that you keep there that could do this exact same thing. 
Well, and the nice thing, at least my opinion on homesteads, is the nice thing that if it, you were in a grid down situation, if you do have animals, they can eat roughage that you can't. And right. they're, they're, their calories are very concentrated, high in fat, and um, they are able to almost live without a blip as long as you have water for them and you can let them graze. And then there's your really good high calories for your family if you did need to be able to, you know. I keep trying to tell my I, goats that I let them out this morning to graze and they look at me like I'm crazy. And they're like, <laughs> no, it's not what we do. <laughs> Well, our goats are finally out on pasture. To I think I think my renter put them out yesterday. Uh, the babies are getting big enough that uh, they're they're out of the they they were out of the barn anyway. Little sneaky babies that they are, and so our goats are out on pasture. We're just about to start watering, and um, the milk is coming in really strong right now. So it's kind of a fun time of year. Oh, it's such a fun time of year. If we had a pig right now, it would probably be a good thing because it is hard for, even though our renters have nine people in their family and we have uh, three here, uh, it's kind of hard to keep up with that much milk. Uh, yeah, I posted that this week on our uh, Facebook page there that milk is, it's a blessing, but it's easy to become overwhelmed by that blessing. Other plans in place aside from just drinking milk, as cheese making is a good way to use excess milk. Uh, that's how I got into soap making because we could only eat so much cheese and drink so much milk. Uh, so I posted that you can use it as fertilizer in the garden. If, uh, use your whey in soups. You can use your whey in bread making. So lots of options for milk and it's not just stuck on drinking milk. And if you are curious about goats, we do have an ebook over in the Etsy store if you're interested in getting into goats or chickens or anything else. We've got quite a few of them over there. You're way ahead of me. So you have a pastry cutter, right? I'm using a fork, which is a little bit slower, but I prefer a pastry cutter if you're going to make pie or biscuits. It's a lot faster. I alternate between using forks and using the pastry cutter. So I did choose to use the pastry cutter today because that felt authentic to me for whatever reason. <laughs> Okay, I find that when I add my milk in, I have to add it just a teeny tiny bit at a time. We have goats too, so um, I'm just going to add it a tiny bit at a time because when you're using paleo or a grain-free, sometimes your texture can turn out a little bit wonky, and you do want a stiff dough when you're making that biscuits. Was, you don't. What's that? As far as as far as food storage, that was something we wanted to discuss, and we did not bring up is that we have different dietary needs. And right. so your food storage is different than my food storage. If right. we are, we're not paleo, we're not gluten-free here. I, I just, I'm not overly concerned about a whole lot of toxins in our diet because we're not super sensitive. So I just store regular all-purpose flour because it works for our family. But you still cook a lot off scratch, like on like from are, scratch. Yeah, we vast majority of our meals are scratch, so we very rarely go out and pick up anything in town. So, so for for a lot of people, it's about frugal. But for some people, for our family in particular, things like preservatives and other um, additives that they put into food is the reason why we don't eat it. But a lot for a lot of people, it's just because they want to be more frugal. They want to save money. Or they like yeah, the flavor what, better. I mean, flavor makes a difference, too. It does make a difference. Totally makes a difference. So, yeah, what brought us into, well, not necessarily homesteading, but prepping, and I didn't even realize this, is we live rurally. And so it's not an easy, oh, we're out of whatever it is and run to the store. It's an hour round trip minimum just to pick up whatever it is. And so for years, we were doing monthly grocery shopping runs, and we have a fully stocked pantry, and we have a bulk storage. And at one point, and I'm hoping you guys get to meet him, I was actually not too long after I had my youngest daughter was watching TV and saw an episode of the Doomsday Preppers. And I mm -hmm. think it was, and I'm now friends with him, Nick Klein. He has hostile hair. And I'm hoping mm -hmm. that with the show that we get to go visit him, and show his setup because he does aquaponics and he raises rabbits for meat and he's just an all over fun and funny guy. 
But um, I think I watched an episode with him, and I turned to my husband and said, oh, my gosh, they have a term for us. We're <laughs> preppers, but we're not like hard doomsday preppers. We just happen to have a well-stocked pantry and buy in bulk, and the lifestyles seem to fit together. So you don't have to right. be this afraid of the apocalypse, the world is going to crash in order to provide for your family and have food storage on hand. I'm going to wash my hands real quick. Okay. This is what my dough looks like. It looks just like Catherine's and it's paleo. And I used, uh, I used Tara's recipe. So what I did was I substituted one uh, cup of tapioca flour for one of the cups of regular flour that she had in a recipe. And, and for the other cup of, of regular flour that she had in her recipe, I added a paleo baking mix that was made of um, bean flour. And so okay. everything else I added exactly the same. And I think it's the last batch I made actually turned out really bad. And this was, I didn't use her recipe. And so what I'm doing on my biscuits is I've already got them in the pan and it's on medium heat and I'm browning both sides. And once I have both sides brown, I'm gonna turn it down to low, put the lid on and let it cook for a bit. And when we were in Tulsa, that's the way that we had to do it too, is we had to use cast iron because for a little while we did not have any kind of stove. Um, it was a rental property that had been empty for a lot of years. And so okay. when we were in Tulsa, that we, this is exactly what, what Catherine's doing is exactly how we cooked our own biscuits. We just need, had to make sure that it was really low and <laughs> that the lid was really heavy. So I've got this big, heavy cast iron lid. And I'm struggling because I'm trying to let them see what I'm doing. <laughs> and I'm right. having to roll them and pat them in a somewhat this strange way. A, I told Julie that filming <laughs> is such an art. So I don't know. They look a little yellow. They're not that yellow in real life. That's my weird lighting in my kitchen. But they are coming along. And I love, there is something very comfort food. This is like the quintessential comfort food is biscuits and gravy. Eating more out of our backyard and our homestead, our health improves significantly. So Ashley's watching. Hey, Ashley. So Sandra says, perfect way to spend my downtime. I love Julianne's videos. Julie's pretty great. I love her videos too. So, so where are you at on your biscuit making process there, Julie? So I am doing this as like a, as a dare to myself to see how long it takes me to get this stove up and going. Okay. And so I'm taking a cold stove. The chimney is not warm. And usually I don't use um, cotton here because the, um, uh, the fire starter, this is a special fire starter that, that won't blow out in like a 40 mile an hour wind. But I generally have like not a match. Usually I have something that I can hold on it a little bit longer. So I put just a little piece of cotton and a little piece of um, tinder on it, hoping that it will help it get just a little bit, give it a tiny bit of a wick. But these, I what I'm going to try and do is see if I can get it started and hot in 10 minutes. Okay. My biscuits may be done before your stove's ready to go. Your biscuits are gonna be done before mine. Um, so, this, I have a cold chimney. If you were, if you were truly off grid and you didn't have propane or anything else, one of the other things you would want is you would want something like a fire pit. And anytime that you're cooking with wood, you're not really wanting to cook over the flames if you, if, unless it's a very, if, unless you need to cook it now fast and, and then you can fry on top of it. That works pretty well. But if what you want is you want to bake something, First off, you need a Dutch oven, and um, a lot of times a Dutch oven will have legs so that it can sit on top of the coals. Right, um, we have one of those. Yeah, and then the lid has a scooped out top so that you're then putting coals on top of the Dutch oven as well. So it cooks from the top and it cooks from the bottom, and coals cook differently than an open flame. Right. So in my, yeah. in my personal yeah. opinion, if I have bad weather, what I really want is I want to be able to cook in something that I can put in shelter. Yeah, exactly. Right. See that rim there? 
from my Dutch oven, and that's what that big lip is designed for, is to set those coals in there. So I don't know if you guys can see this, but my biscuit's really puffed up. So I'm going to flip them one more time, and then I am going to put my lid on. All right. The wind just blew my front so. door open, so I close it. <laughs> Um, one thing that they used to do if they were going to be off grid is that they would create something like an off grid or no, no, an outdoor kitchen. And then they would actually move. So you can see my wood stove. They would move their wood stove from inside their cabin out to the outdoor kitchen. The reason being is that if you don't have central air, if you don't have air conditioning, if you light that stove inside the house, you're going to be baking yourself, not just the bread. Um, so and so they would have an extra kitchen. Brilliant. So I know right. you and I were talking about this earlier, so here we go, I'm putting my lid on, but uh, backup plans as far as cooking is a must, as we mm -hmm. had thought for years that our backup plan was going to be our barbecue propane grill outside, and it never fails that when we lose power, it's usually during some massive either snowstorm or rainstorm, and I've actually had my teenage daughter refuse to eat what it is that we're preparing for and she's just like insistent on I want macaroni and cheese or something that has to be cooked and so we've sent her out front in a blizzard to cook over our barbecue and it did not go well for her so if we had some sort of space like an outdoor kitchen as that would be I, I think if you're truly looking at a preparedness for really bad times or you're going to be truly off grid an outdoor kitchen is a must well, and, and it doesn't have to be expensive. It can be something as simple as what we did is we enclosed our front porch in plastic for the winter. And I need to do the same thing for the summer, except I need to use um, bug screening, if that makes sense. Uh, it does. Netting. And yeah. then maybe some shutters that we can add on to it. And, and it would make it nicer to live with because it means if the wind comes up, um, I can cook outside without the flame being blown out. If it's raining, I'm not sitting out there in the in the um, in the rain trying to cook, and and that cost thirty dollars. That wasn't something where I had to go build a whole new addition onto my house. I just had to frame in, and put plastic up. Right. And we don't have a neat little porch like you do, as we do have in our backyard. I have an area that I've penciled in, and what I would really like for long-term preparedness and just general comfort is a sleeping porch. And that's really yeah. common here in the desert southwest is, well, not so much now, but back in the day before central air conditioning was people had sleeping porches. And so what I'd like right. to do is convert an area in our backyard and have something similar, an outdoor kitchen slash sleeping porch. And that way, uh, well, we, in fact, we don't have air conditioning here in our house. We have something called an evaporative cooler. It's also called a swamp cooler. Right. But it, we don't run it except for maybe just a month or two over the summer. So I would absolutely love to have an area that we could escape that we don't necessarily have to heat or cool. So. Well, and I think even with air conditioning, sometimes the air gets really stale. Um, if you feel like you can't open windows because it's too warm. And I think, I think that's brilliant. And, and they have the same thing back in down South is everywhere we went, if you saw old houses, they had the big veranda with the, you know, with, that was all screened in so that you could get some air, um, but not have to be exposed to all the insects and everything. Yeah, as we don't have a lot of insect issues here, so, but I can see where that would be really important to protect yourself from in some environments. Yeah. Um, we we're talking about alternative cooking styles, and I know that we've discussed propane and barbecues, and as we have a little camp grill, and I've, contemplated bringing it in. I know that there's some safety concerns as far as running propane inside and not having the open air ventilation. So it's not something that I've done yet, but I think in an emergency situation, if you have enough ventilation, that would be safe. But you also right. have to be considerate of storing fuels. So propane, you can store, I believe it's indefinitely, and so I don't think it has much of a shelf life, but at some point you will run out of your stores. So, because you can't store enough propane to cook forever. And so right. I, I like the idea of having these layers of, you know, you could have your propane grill, you could have your little stove, you can have 
I, I love your wood stove, the rocket mass stove, and that's something at some point that I would love to have in my house as well. But to have that versatility of being able to go outside and cook over an open fire or right. on your burning stove or your barbecue. And that's something that I know that we were discussing as far as cast iron goes, is this is your tool that does it all. And it cooks well on your, like on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not just for prepping, it makes superior food every day the, yeah we use ours all the time too so it's one of those things that it's a good investment and if you're gonna buy cookware anyway it would be smart to invest in something that you can use in many situations i am working on a second batch um okay. which I, it made sometimes with paleo flowers it doesn't rise terribly well and since i'm waiting for the stove to warm up a little bit i wanted to give myself um, another batch to try on. And Very with this nice. one, I'm using shortening, palm shortening instead of butter. And I've never cooked with palm shortening. I know it's not considered a terribly sustainable uh, oil because a lot of times I guess it, it deforests things, but I spent more money to get this because I understand that it's actually pretty good for you. Okay. And, yeah, and they said that this was. I know it's used a lot in soaping, and that's one of those I've stayed away from because I know there is controversy as far as how it's harvested. Yeah. So, uh, exactly. here. Marion asked, favorite brand of cast iron? Most all of mine is really old. This okay. I got from a friend of mine at church. She's um, probably my parents' age, but it was her mother's. And I got a whole set from her. They were scaling down and moving from their home into an apartment. And one of the things that they were looking to rehome was their cast iron. And we use a lot of lodge. Uh, we go into Cabela's or into Sportsman's Warehouse if we feel like we need. But it, I think some of them can be very gimmicky. For me, if you have a really nice, deep, uh, big one that you could use for gravies, you can use it for tortillas, you can use it for cake. You really don't need right. to have a cake pan or a bread pan in order to right. use cast iron. It they that is kind of gimmicky, like the cornbread looking one or the or you know, you really don't need to spend more money on another pan that's just shaped like a piece of corn. So I I used to drink a lot of I have nerve pain in my right arm, and I it's ongoing nerve damage. And a lot of times over the winter I'll heat up water and turmeric and some cracked pepper and add it to either soups or my drink and it's supposed to help with pain relief and specifically it helps uh calm down the nerves in my hand and my arm so but that's one of my favorites it's a teeny tiny guy okay catherine can you see this can you see my biscuits i can see your biscuits yes oh. this is super fun we should do there this like go. experimentation every time i'm telling you i'm impressed with the art that is filming I'm like, oh, you just turn on a camera and go. That's not it. I sit right. here for like an hour. <laughs> my camera and the angle and the lighting and opening windows and closing windows. And I still I still don't like what this thing is. So. Okay, so I just put my shortening in. And are yours done or are they getting close? They're just about done. I'm going to pull them off here in a second and then I'm going to start my gravy. My family's thrilled that we're doing biscuits and gravy. My youngest daughter is already talking about, as soon as mom turns off that camera, I'm eating biscuits. You're, you're going to do the recipe that's conventional, which has flour in it, correct? Yes. For the gravy, yes. Okay. So for anybody who has uh, celiac or gluten tendencies, uh, tapioca or arrowroot works just as well, but you need to treat it more like cornstarch instead of flour. I have arrowroot powder. I've never cooked with it. I bought it for my lotions because it works. And there again, this is one of those multi-use food storage things. Most of the products that I use in both my soap and my lotion and my body care are average everyday cooking products. And so if you're stocking up for cooking, oftentimes you're stocking up for taking care of the outside of your body too. So uh, I use arrowroot powder. It's good for absorbing the extra oils. So when I make lotions to keep them from being extra greasy, I add arrowroot powder to help with absorption. So it's one of those, when you buy it, you can use it for many different applications. So. Right. Anything you wouldn't put in your mouth, you probably don't want to put on your body. Amen to that.
Now, I do think that the shortening actually smells kind of interesting. So I'm not sure if I'd use it again. I didn't smell this smell when I was using the butter, and I've never used palm shortening before. Okay. So I'm kind of interested in what the smell is, because they said you can interchange it for butter or any other kind of um, baking or anything that you could with butter. So this is going to be an orange, interesting, interesting smell. Interesting smell. Okay. Huh. Yeah, I don't know what to think about that. I've cooked with lard before that's yeah. kind of funky. Yeah. And I like lard. I like cooking with lard, but this one particular batch of lard that I used had a particular odor, and it definitely came through to the food. Um, if you've ever watched Farmstead Meatsmith, he teaches you what part of the pig you actually want to get pastry fat from. There's a particular part of the pig that has delicate lard, delicate fat that turns into delicate lard, and, and you don't want to use the lard from the rest of the body to make that lard. Oh, that's good to know. So I know we were talking about this earlier, is I have 100 pounds of pig fat in my freezer, and we definitely, we were talking about maybe doing a show on rendering lard someday, and yeah. I would definitely appreciate getting that 100 pounds of lard out of my, or out of the fat out <laughs> of my Well, and the nice thing is with that, with, with any kind of fat, you can actually render it and turn it into a winter uh, uh, protein and fat source for your chickens. Right. Um, it's what suet is made out of is you just add your grains into your into your fat and it gives the birds you so you can make your own suet for your chickens if you have homegrown uh, My fat. Was high there so I got a little brown there but they look delicious they look actually worse on camera than they do in real life <laughs> they don't look that bad Think in camera. I think camera I think mine, when I made it, they rose so high. I was really surprised at how high they wanted to rise. And my problem was is they were trying to come out the side and push the lid off because they rose so well when we did it before. Wow, look at that. I've never had, like, yellow. It's almost turmeric looking, isn't it? Yeah, that's what it looks like over the camera, too. I was going to ask if it's that yellow in real life. It is. It is just yellow in real life. So that's the palm oil that did that. Yeah, that's the palm, um, the palm, I think they call it, yeah, palm oil, and this one was supposedly harvested very uh, responsibly, but I've okay. never used it before, so I'm not really sure how good it's going to taste, because it has a very distinctive smell. Interesting. See, I like experimenting. Sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes you learn. Weird. Yeah. Right. But these are quite light. These are trying to rise very very well. I'm really happy with this recipe so far. And mine rose, my pan is pretty deep, so it didn't get to the point where it was trying to push the lid off. And okay. But mine definitely probably doubled in height. I think I'm going to make these a little taller so they'll all fit in the pan. Okay, so my stove is now hot. And um, so it's actually not unbearably warm in here. The, the draft on my rocket stove is so good and strong that it's sucking most of the heat right out of the building up the chimney and okay. only kind of bypassing it in the oven a little bit. So it looks like I am ready to put my lid on. And hopefully the Honeydew Carpenter is out there somewhere ready to answer questions because it really is a fantastic. Um, I saw him on here. I don't know if he's still on here. So I'm going to scroll back and sorry for my finger and the screen here guys so let's see here mary says hi there girls my friend ed was watching douglas says great buy at walmart 18 dollars." i'm not sure what he's referring to i should probably read in chronological order rather than backwards <laughs> okay so Thanks. this is my tray i move that back and i'm going to put the lid on so that the heat can build up okay i am using so I've got my bacon grease and I'm getting ready to make the gravy. So I'm, and it's pretty, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but these recipes from Dining on a Dime, let me show you the cookbook. For anybody who joined us late, we are cooking biscuits and gravy out of Dining on a Dime cookbook. Uh, Tara has graciously allowed us to be affiliates of hers. So if you guys do buy this through the link, and I believe that John has it pinned, it looks like it is, but if you buy through that link, uh, Julie and I, it benefits our homestead, so every 
purchased through you guys is greatly appreciated. But one of the operating philosophies that Tara has is it's got to be quick, it's got to be easy. Is, uh, she's not into any recipe that takes long periods of time. I don't know if you guys follow her channel. She's on Living on a Dime. But she's all about frugal living. Mary, I love this cookbook too. And every time I use it, I fall more and more in love with it. So because I, I'm a working mom, and so I have a full-time job, I have a homestead, and so I don't have a lot of time to be in here slaving away. And so anything I can get in here, bust it out as fast as I can, and feed my family, all the better. But so far, my family has loved everything out of this book. As I think I said this before, I'm, we're in New Mexico. We're very particular about our Mexican food. I made enchiladas out of this last week, and my daughter stood at the kitchen stove with a spoon and ate the enchilada sauce right out of the pot. That's not like her. So everything out of this book has been a big hit so far. But anyways, the biscuits, I don't know if you guys noticed, it takes just minutes to put together. This gravy is going to take just minutes to put together. It's a... We started off the show by making our own baking powder. Two ingredients, took just seconds. So we've got a pretty much from scratch start to finish here. So, and I am using, like I said, my own bacon grease, and this is from our own pig that we harvested. So to make our gravy here. And Julie, she is paleo. I am not paleo, so we're both kind of cooking the same item through different methodologies. So, all right, and here goes my gravy making. So, and with this too, so it is three ingredients plus salt and pepper. And it just so happens that two of the ingredients are right here from my homestead. So my goat milk and then the bacon grease and flour. That's really it. So as soon as this bacon grease is melted down, I'm going to add some flour. And essentially you make a roux, which is where you darken your flour in the grease to whatever darkness or consistency it is you're looking for. And then you add the milk to it. And then salt and pepper to taste. And that's really it. So, oh, we were talking about bulk storage earlier. I know that uh, we were talking about scaling it. So we buy salt by the 25 pound bag. We store it in mason jars. And then for our everyday use, we do it in a shaker. And I know that's really common sense that everybody out there is like, well, yeah. But for those of you who were just getting into food storage and you go, well, now I've got this 25 pound bag. Now what? So. Move it around. Make it work for you. Okay, so what I wanted to show was that if you do not have animal grease to flavor your white gravy with, uh, one thing that's really good to have on hand is garlic powder. And the other thing to have on hand is onion powder. It's nice to have real onions and real garlic because they can create that, I think it's called umami flavor that kind of is similar to meat. But if mm -hmm. you can add fat to your gravy and some onion powder and or some garlic powder, some onion powder, and a little bit of salt and pepper, you can actually imitate the flavor of drippings or some kind of meat without actually adding the meat. As, as long as you have enough fat in it so that you kind of get that those calories that you need. Right. Um, it's good to have the drippings, but if you don't have them, you can still make a really good gravy. Uh, as long as you have, and what's that? I was going to say, I'm glad you brought that up because I think spices are such an important part of food storage. So, yeah, and they're uh, easy food to store. Is not living. Yeah, well, well and, and a lot of people think um, of those little teeny tiny spices as spices, and really, you can see how many spices I have here and how big these jars are. A lot of times you can get them in bulk. And you save money on it, but it also makes a pretty display. It doesn't have to be fancy or expensive. These are just regular mason jars with um, little, I don't know. Catherine, can you see the screw? Yes. Oh, that's so, brilliant. That's smart. I figured they were magnetic. That's smart. No, it's just a screw through the top of the lid. And that way, um, 
you can just use some really basic things. And I think it adds to the look of the kitchen, but it's also very easy to reach. And I can store a larger quantity than I could if I was doing it um, any other way. So I turned my timer off when my biscuits were done. So I think 12 minutes sounds about right. Okay, so how long does it take a conventional oven to come up to heat? It says about 15 to 20 minutes to cook them. What I did was I looked at mine and I was looking for the sides to no longer be moist. Okay. And and if we had a conventional oven and you were doing a preheat, how long do you think you'll preheat to get to 400 degrees? Oh, that's a good question. Maybe five to 10 minutes, I would assume. Okay. That's how we knew our oven was dying because it took us four hours to heat up to 350. <laughs> that's terrible. Yeah. Ouch, that's really hot. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to set a timer for 12 minutes, and I know that Catherine needs to go. You're not getting something you don't want. I've never bought from Azure Standard. I don't. I would assume that they would have safe spices. My mom really likes Azure Standard. I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit this in. So hot, so hot. Okay, so with the rocket stove, it's really rocket, and I do not have it directed out the bench. This is the rocket stove, and I can direct it into the bench, but if I correct, uh, direct it into the bench, it will slow the heat down, and I want the heat to stay high. And okay. so I am building up, a, I have a pretty good size bed of coals right now that's pretty good but with this rocket stove you have to keep fuel added into it um, because right now I don't have it into the bench and all the heat is just going straight up into the oven and then straight into the chimney what is your favorite comfort food to make as if you were to store materials like I don't know that I would want to live life without brownies and cookies I have openly confessed my addiction to brownies and cookies before so that is something we keep cocoa powder on hand. That's one of my, if we don't have seven pounds of cocoa powder on my shelf, I'm feeling like we are a little thin. So and the gravy recipe is also out of the Dining on a Dime. Yes. And gravy. it's meant to be used with scraps. Like it's not meant to be like a, hey, let's do this fancy gravy. You're meant to use uh, drippings from like a chicken. If you had a chicken the night before and you made bone broth, um, you could substitute that, or if you had a pot roast the night before. It's meant to be not like, hey, go buy a whole chicken because you're going to be making this gravy tomorrow. Okay, I'm going to talk about my stove for a minute while I'm cursing my stove. Um, this, is, this is an Elmira. This is an Elmira uh, Fire View, I think. And it's a wood burning cook stove. So it has like, it has the oven, it has the warming oven. We actually have found a rice we can eat, and it's sprouted rice. <laughs> Sorry for the distraction. Oh, not. But this is the propane attachment. So I actually can cook on propane in the summer um, without the wood stove going. Oh, very nice. Yeah, that stove is a thing of beauty. So let's see here. Mary says mashed potatoes and meatloaf. That's her comfort food. Yes. So... John says jerky or chocolate. I think jerky and chocolate are both super important. Okay. I think one of the things I like most about these recipes is how simple they are because, I like for instance, I'm going to go ahead and add cayenne pepper to my milk gravy because I like that flavor. And there's no strong flavors in this gravy that is going that are going to make it seem like if I add my own spices, it's going to interfere with them. I'm going to add garlic salt to mine. So it's just a very, very basic gravy. And it's also the way that you can make your own soup bases. You know you know how when you're actually using a recipe that calls for soup bases, like cream and mushroom soup, if you make right. your own gravy, yep. it's a substitute. And, and it's just dry ingredients. Yep. And if you want cream of mushroom, you make this and you add mushrooms. And so that way you, you you have all your basics without having to have all the um, expense and space of having to store them with all their liquid and, and having 
Yeah. Can you guys see so, this? It is beautiful. Whoop, turning the wrong way. Look at that. My family is going to be so excited. So if you did want to turn it into cream of mushroom soup base for cooking later, that you would just take a can of mushrooms and add it. Yep. Okay. So my stove is going so hot right now that it's probably, I would guess it's about 700 degrees on top of the stove and all the heat is going in here and then up in here. So what I need to do is open up the top. There's this little thingy, see that? Okay. That opens and closes. I need to just make sure it's open just a little bit so that some of that hot air can escape so that I'm not getting a 700 degree oven. Right. So I see Tara's with us and she is the author of the book Dining on a Dime. And she's the one who has graciously allowed us to be affiliated with her. Thank you, Tara. So we absolutely love your book and the food that we make. So we did, I did cast iron on the stove top. So there's my biscuits. They got a little brown because I had my pan a little too hot, but they are absolutely gorgeous. My gravy is done. Would have just taken minutes had we not been gabbing. But right. family is thrilled for biscuits and gravy. As soon as I hit X on this phone to turn the camera off, my little one is racing in to eat biscuits. So. I have my window open. And it's in the 60s, high 60s today, but okay. it's not hot in here because it's all going out the chimney. And I'm really worried that they're going to be burning. So that's your new oven that Darwin just installed, isn't it? Yeah, that's the new oven. That is so, so neat. Isn't it neat? It's really warm right now. And we need to get a handle on it, but it's working and it's not burning, which is super super exciting because it's summer I'm cooking indoors in the summer and it's not hot in here because everything is insulated and going out the chimney okay I cannot find my pepper which you're supposed to put black pepper in any kind of uh, gravy like this and so I put cayenne pepper in so it's not going to have the same little uh, black flakes but again being off-grid you don't want to dirty up a lot of pans so I'll show you mine. And so I use the pan that I mixed my biscuits in. So you'll see a little bit of that kind of turmeric color looking stuff on the side. But um, it won't affect the flavor at all. I just need to conserve water. And it was a, a known, uh, I knew exactly what was in the pan. And on top of that, the flour also that I was using my paleo flour would thicken it as well. So there's my... So there's my gravy, and that took me about maybe three minutes from the time I started. Uh, are you eating the gravy? Really I'm tempted yeah. to eat mine. It's actually really good. Um, I don't know. I guess we could sit and spin for a minute if we wanted to. I, I know that traditionally that would have been something you would have been doing while you were sitting and waiting for cooking to finish. We had one of the ladies that bought one of our spinning wheels contact me and say she couldn't figure out how to get her um, how to get her wool to stay on. She was having a real problem with it um, breaking. Okay. And, and so I thought maybe I would show them how to how to use a core again. Unless you want to yeah. talk about the cookbook because I I'm not sure what else to do while I'm waiting for those to bake. No, I, I'm glad that you're showing that because when you taught me how to use a core like that and what she means by using a core is uh, you as you're spinning you place a little bobbin of thread on one of the bobbin holders and you actually spin on the thread. And uh, I'm brand new to spinning too. As Julie, when she and I first got together, she says, we'll do spinning shows together. And I'm up for an adventure. So I was like, sure. <laughs> and then I told her, you know, I don't know how to spin, right? So she's essentially taught me how to spin and I've gotten pretty good over the last month. I don't mean to brag, but I'm like actually making yarn and it's beautiful. But she taught me this too, is you put the thread there and you spin onto it and that way your thread won't break as you're spinning. And it makes you feel like you know what you're doing versus making you feel like you want to throw your wheel. Uh -huh. so. I am, I need to start using something bright or I need to paint the wall behind me instead of using all these pastel, you know, like shiny colors that nothing shows up on. 
Right. Or I guess I could move the, either that or I have to figure out how to move the camera. Mm -hmm. We'll see how they turn out. They, they actually, the last time I made that and I used a different recipe, it ended up being a nasty sticky mess and I had to double the dry ingredients on it and it was just nasty. With this one, you watched me try it for the first time and it turned out the first time. And it had a lovely dough and it was awesome. Um, and so I, I, I do think that a lot of it can be uh, substituted, like you have the egg substitute if you're doing baking and you want to do it without eggs, for instance. Um, so we'll see how much longer those have. What, we, what Darwin was wanting to do, the honeydew carpenter who built my oven, he wanted to put a thermostat in the oven, but we didn't get that far. And I think it really would improve the stove because I keep having to open the oven to check on the temperature. And every time I do that, I'm losing heat out the oven. So, and I'm concerned that they're going to burn. Okay, they actually, I think those are done. Okay, so you guys got to see the unveiling. Okay, so the thing... The big thing I want to point out right now is that I'm in a sweatshirt and I am not sweating at all. There's no sweating. I have one window open, but it's 68 degrees outside and I'm not sweating and I just baked biscuits inside. Oh, I'm going to need a hot pad. Okay, so they smell heavenly. So these are Tara's uh, doing it, uh, do, sorry, dining on a dime biscuits in paleo form yeah this is mike's biscuits but i turned them into paleo biscuits and you can see one of them where i like i was like trying to test it too soon so that's the one thing i'd like to change on the oven is i would really like to change it so that i had a thermostat in there so i didn't have to open it and like poke things um and then yeah <laughs> it would have been a good idea for me to use a hot pad so these are done Can you see it? Those are my biscuits. Oh, I'm making a mess. There's my biscuits. They're not too crumbly. They're just hot. So there we go. There's the biscuits. Okay. I'm going to go pop off. And if you guys like the show, make sure to share it because we'd like to do this every week and we're going to try and alternate between gardening shows and spinning shows and cooking shows and prepper shows. So we're and I'm going to go eat my biscuit.